Good morning. So we don't have class on Thursday, and then your next homework assignment, homework 14, is due the Thursday after that. Uh, today we're going to talk about two different ways of uh, estimating costs. Uh, one incorporates the idea of a learning curve, and the other is cost index. And you can find that in the book in section 3 of chapter 15. Just as a reminder, I would encourage you to make good use of the money that you've spent on your textbook. You spent hundreds of dirhams for those books, and so you definitely should uh, read through them once in a while, um, especially as the final exam gets closer. So what we're going to do is, first of all, talk about the idea that when people, oh, we've got a new projector, so it's plenty bright enough. When people will do a task over and over, they get better at it. And so you can probably think in your own case of examples of things that you did for the first time and you were really slow at. And then, as you did it more times, because you maybe learned shortcuts, or you were avoiding mistakes, uh, as your experience went on, uh, you were able to improve how quickly you did it. So in the case of the picture here, you know, garment workers who are uh, making clothes, uh, if you've ever seen video of them doing that, they just zip through with the sewing machine so quickly. And I remember when I was actually a student in the U.S. in middle school. When you're young, they have you take a class that's called home economics. And they had us do some sewing. That was one of the classes that I had when I was young, was maybe two or three weeks we did some sewing. And we were so slow at it. And, you know, kids are putting the needle through their finger accidentally, very clumsy and slow. But these people are professionals because they do it so often. And the same thing is true whether it is uh, manual labor man man making clothes, or in the case of uh, highly skilled labor, the assembly of cars, you can see that they've learned skills over time and uh, tips on how to do things so that they can do it fast. So they're sitting in these comfortable looking chairs as they work, presumably because uh, they found out that they could work more quickly and more efficiently by sitting rather than crouching. Because if they're crouching, that gives them muscle fatigue, whereas if they're sitting in this case, it allows them to do the task for longer with less strain on their body. So um, there's a way to model this effect, to quantitatively describe how quickly you improve at doing things. And that's called a learning curve. Basically, it takes into account increased productivity and um, organizational performance. Maybe it may be uh, as simple as laying the tools that are going to be used in a certain order. And if you've seen pictures or videos of surgery, for instance, uh, the scalpel is in a certain place on a tray next to the patient, the scissors, you know, all of the instruments that are going to be needed are in a very specific way. It's handed to the doctor in a specific way because all of those, all of those little improvements um, allow for a better service to be offered. Uh, sometimes this is called the manufacturing process function. And it's important for you to be aware of it as you do cost analysis, because sometimes during a pilot study, you'll do a short-term experiment to, take, how, uh, to uh, take an idea of how long it takes to, uh, to build something. So if you're estimating the amount of time required for construction, maybe you have the workers on a different job pouring a foundation, a small foundation, and it takes them a certain amount of time. So if you're taking that information, how long it takes to pour a certain area, and you're trying to apply it to a much larger project, what you would need to take into account is that the people are going to be getting better over time. And so when they have more experience, when they're already mobilized at a certain job site and don't have to go through the steps of starting over in a new location, then they're going to be getting this experience curve. So here is one way of representing how people progress as they get new experience. Now this model is an exponential model, model and uh, it starts off with the first thing I want to tell you about is this factor S. And the way to describe that is let's say that you are involved in manufacturing pants. You're sewing pants in a factory. If you measure the amount of time it takes you to sew the first pair of pants, maybe it's 15 minutes. And then the second pair of pants that you sew is 14 minutes. So in that case, you've doubled your productivity. You've gone from 
having ever in your life sewed one pair of pants to two pair of pants. And so that's doubling the amount that you've sewed. And S is going to be the ratio of how much time it took. So it would be 14 minutes for the second pair and 15 minutes for the first pair. So first to second is a doubling to go from the when you've made a total of two pants to four pants, that's doubling from two to four. From four to eight is a doubling in productivity. So to double the number that have previously been made. So that's your cumulative experience. So the reason why you have to calculate this S, the ratio in time, is because then it's used to calculate N, which is the learning curve exponent. And it is a function that we're going to substitute into the main equation where the main equation is starting with k, which is how much time it took you to do the first product. And so back to the idea of the pants, if it took you 15 minutes to make your first pair of pants, then that's what you put in for k. And then inside the brackets here is going to be a ratio, like a, uh, it's going to be a decimal less than one, and you get faster and faster the more uh, experience you have. And so U is the output unit number. It's the third item, the fourth item, the fifth item, and so on. And so then Z sub U tells you how much time is required. And here it's saying output unit and input resource. We can think of the input resource as time. And then the output unit uh, is whatever's being made. Maybe it's uh, the surgery that's being performed, the, the pants that are being sewed, and, and so on. All right, so I have an in-class exercise for you to uh, get a little bit of experience with this equation. Let me hand that out. We're looking at a Rubik's Cube. Has anybody tried to solve a Rubik's Cube before? They're pretty hard, but I'm told there's like a certain formula where like you can get in a pattern and solve them just by uh, twisting it in a certain pattern, you can solve it every time and not actually have to think about it at all. There's like a trick. I think it takes some time to memorize the trick, but I've seen it done. Someone just applying that algorithm and then automatically solving it. So, in this example, mm -hmm. all right, so in this example, let's start off by actually graphing it before you begin your calculations because it's called the learning curve let's visualize the curve aspect of it and you'll notice that there's some data missing we're going to have to back calculate to find that data all right so here's our spreadsheet just paste the data in all right um, so I'm going to just for purposes of graphing eliminate where we have gaps in the data. And then, let's see, sometimes Excel does a pretty good job of guessing what the graph should be, sometimes not so good. And this is one of those not so good cases. All right, so I'm gonna uh, change what it's selecting for the data. And I'll add my own. So, actually it might have just been the gap. That's better, right? All right, so what we have here is the number of units that have been made and then how much time it takes. And so the number of times you've solved the puzzle and then how long it takes you to, uh, to solve the puzzle. Okay, now with the curve, you can get an idea. Let me just format it starting at 15. Yeah. So it's two, three, four, six, seven. So it's just smoothing all the data points. I can have it show the data points and you'll see uh, what data is still there. Um, we'll do it this one. Okay, so this is the data that we have and then it's smoothing in between. So what we're going to do first of all is we need to find out how long did it take to solve it the first time. We don't have the data exactly but we can estimate by finding out what is the pattern in doubling, for instance, from 2 to 4, because we do have that ratio in S. So we can go from the second to the fourth and find out what was the improvement, and then back calculate to the first one to estimate how much time it probably took the first time we solved the Rubik's Cube. And the reason why we care about the first time is remember that 
That is what K is. K is the number of resource units, and our resource units is time, needed to produce uh, the, the first one that we did. So K here is input resource units needed to produce the first output unit. So the first time you solve the puzzle, basically how long did it take? And then um, uh, once you have S, you can also, in addition to back calculating what is K, then you can get N. And so there's two things we want to know. We want to know, oh, this is the wrong one, sorry. We want to know uh, how long will it take you to solve the Rubik's Cube the hundredth time you try? Like, how good are you going to improve? You can already see the curve is beginning to flatten out. But what is the projected amount of time it'll take once you have 100 total times that you've solved the puzzle? All right, so go ahead and... All right, so you'll notice that what I did was uh, I just wanted to double check that it's okay for me to go from the second to the fourth versus from the fourth to the eighth. I wanted to make sure that that S factor is the same because if it's not, then that tells me that my model, this a model being a formula, if, if I can't even get it to accurately predict from second to fourth and then fourth to eighth with this model, then I definitely shouldn't extrapolate all the way to the hundredth time. And so I double checked and the S factor is the same, regardless of whether I go from two to four or four to eight. So that verifies that the S factor is okay and uh, we can proceed with the rest of the calculation. So calculating the N exponent and then I have to back calculate K. So that data was missing. I, I forgot to time it my first time, but I can estimate based on the trend. And so if we go back to the graphical representation, I could draw a line and follow the same basic pattern and find out when it intercepts one. And from the calculations, it looks like it's 26.4. So let me extend this, reformat this axis here to 27. Uh, let's do it, 19. So if we were going to continue drawing that line, it looks like 26.4 is what this says. So it's getting steeper and steeper. I think that's probably right in the vicinity, graphically. All right, so um, we get the uh, first time K value and then just substitute all that in. It should take 14.1 minutes after we've done it 100 times. So I hope you can see how this information would be useful in cost estimating out on the job. <clears throat> You observe your workers their first day and find out what they accomplished. Observe them on the second day, on the fourth day. And you basically plot the trend and you can find out over the life of the job the average amount of time it's going to take to do things. Because at the beginning of the job, they're slow at activities. At the end of the job, they're fast. And so when you're doing your cost analysis, this is one of the factors that needs to be accounted for. Any questions before we move on? Sure. Uh, K, what I did was I said, <clears throat> if from the second to the fourth, I've doubled my productivity, you know, because four is double of two. And I look at the trend and uh, the ratio of the time. So 21.84 to 24. Well, from one to two is also a doubling in how much that I've done. So I'm saying I can use this ratio of 0.91 and use it, that it's the pattern of how, how the improvements are happening to back calculate the missing data of, of how long it took me. So 26.38 is just uh, using the ratio of 0.91, which is the pattern for the rest of the doublings from 2 to 4, 4 to 8. And instead of moving forward with it, I moved backwards with it. All right. The second thing we're talking about today are called cost indexes. And a cost index is a way of tracking prices of things over time. And um, what we do with a cost index is we say, 
um, a certain year, we set the index to 100. And then over time, as the price fluctuates, then we will have that price, rather than expressing it as its actual price, we just express it relative to the original price. And there's a lot of different places where cost indexes can come from. Uh, in the case of just overall prices in an economy, there's something called the consumer price index that tells you the price of groceries and fuel and gasoline. And this is a US statistic, but there's also an Emirates uh, Statistics Bureau that prepares a, uh, a cost consumer index. Um, in the construction field, there are different um, publications that keep track of the types of things that influence costs of projects, breaking it down uh, into labor, common labor, skilled labor, materials, and so finding out what has been the cost historically of reinforcing steel, for instance. And so looking at the past cost trends, you can use a cost index to predict what the costs will be in the future. And the reason why that's valuable is that you can look at the cost that it took to uh, generate a job, you know, the overall construction cost of a, bil a building in the past, and then if you know how the individual components have changed over time in terms of their cost, how the concrete has changed, the steel, the labor costs, it allows you to estimate, uh, estimate what the costs in the future might be by using uh, the index that we're going to see. And so here's a, the Emirates Consumer Price Index is showing uh, how different costs have increased over time. And uh, they're very useful information sources. So here's the general idea for how you use a cost index. There is cost data, C0, for some past time. This is the previous thing that was built. C sub t is the item that you're trying to predict what the cost is going to be. And the way that you predict it is you take the ratio of the index at the present to the index back when the item was constructed. And so if you go to this consumer index and you find that the index of prices today is 200 and you know that in the past the index of prices was 150 and you have the cost that some specific item cost back in that earlier time, then it allow you to predict the cost of the specific item today. Now, this is just a single parameter cost index. You can break the overall cost index down into categories. Remember in the case of construction, there may be that you have a job that includes common labor, meaning the laborers, skilled labor, your job may have materials, and some costs go up faster than others. In recent months, the fuel prices have gone down here in the UAE, and now they're starting to go up a little bit more. But just because one, fuel, just because one cost component is going down doesn't mean that everything is going down. And so you can break up the categories and, uh, and keep track of each of those costs separately. And that's what we're going to do in the next part of today's in-class exercise on the reverse side of the page. We have an example where we're trying to build something that has three cost categories. Um, our overall cost is broken up into labor, which accounts for 30% of our expenses. The materials, which is 20% of the expenses. And equipment, which is 50% of expenses. The data that we have is back in 2004, it cost $650,000 to build a repair garage. And we're trying to figure out how much it's going to cost to build a repair garage today, today being 2008. So what we can do is here is the index back in 2004, and here is the index data for 2008. So we're going to prepare a ratio using these formulas to find the cost in 2008 based on the 2004 version of the cost. So it's a prediction category, category by category. So in step A, I'd like you to calculate an index, uh, a weighted index, to find out what is the uh, 2004 weighted index. And, then, uh, and, and so the 2004 weighted index is going to have 30% of labor, 20% of materials, 
50% of equipment and so on. So do that for 2004 and 2008, and then once you've solved that, you can apply this overall formula to find the cost in 2008 for Part C. Yeah? The consumer price index is an example of a type of cost index. There's many, there's many different ones, but it's just, it's one of the category. How is what? Well, uh, inflation is what's causing these prices to go up. So it is definitely related to inflation. So yeah, this is a way of maybe getting a, a closer look at inflation of specific items rather than as a whole. You know, in this example, one of the assumptions that's given in the problem statement is probably a little unrealistic. It's probably unrealistic that in both 2004 and 2008, equipment is going to be 50% of the costs. You know, if the costs themselves are going up and down, it may be the percentages are going up and down. But that's a simplification we're given in the problem statement. So. What you, uh, what you can do is calculate the index for 2004, the index for 2008, and then the approach here is you take the cost in the original year for which you have the data known, so 2004, and we go back, our 2004 amount was uh, 650,000, so then you can just uh, multiply that 650,000 by the ratio of the two indices and get 778,000. Now, Part D, I was asking you to break it down by component, just so you can know how much you're spending in each category. So, labor, materials, equipment, and so on. All right. <laughs> 